<laughs> Absolutely. And actually, that's probably a very good segue. But Arnie, my question for you is sort of following up on what I was asking about before when it comes to uh, uh, dispersal of, of this contamination, what there may be of it. You indicated some is going into the atmosphere and a piece of this is going into the ocean and parts are going into the debris field and the rest is spreading out over land. How do you see this traveling, say, east across the Pacific in terms of the traces of, of contamination, and what do you see happening with it? Uh, yeah, I think most of the airborne releases are gone now. Now, there still could be a hydrogen explosion, and, and uh, that would, of course, revolatilize everything again. But uh, barring that, or uh, my biggest fear remains uh, Fukushima Unit 4, which in a severe earthquake could still collapse, and the fuel pool is, um, is very precarious. Uh, so barring uh, an earthquake that knocked over Fukushima 4 or a hydrogen explosion, I think most of the airborne releases are, are over in, to a large degree. They're still going to be releasing cesium, but not anywhere near as much as in March or April. So we're at a point with the airborne releases where we can't run and we can't hide and it's pretty much uniformly distributed. It did fall more heavily on the, on the Cascades in, in your neck of the woods. Um, it seems like the, uh, you know, as the, as the moist air moved across the Pacific, it hit the Rockies and, and dumped on the Cascades. Um, we have data from uh, Portland and uh, in the Oregon area that shows around uh, 80 uh, becquerels per, uh, per or a kilogram in the uh, in the soil, so it's there, but it's not as significant, I believe, as what's happening in in your ocean. Um, it, we're it's it's slower though. You know, the the ocean moves the ocean current move a lot slower than the yeah, air current. So I think we've got a slug of cesium and other things that are being picked up by the by the benthic organisms and working their way up the food chain into. Uh, the, the, the top of the food chain animals like tuna and salmon. I, I love salmon and I'm eating as much as I can this year because I'm a little bit concerned, you know, two or three years out that we'll start to see increasing cesium levels in it. Yeah, that's just a, a frightening prospect and I think it's one of those things, um, you, the David Bloom and, and uh, Jay Nichols were on last program, our, our viewers would recall, and, and one of the things we were talking about is what is happening to um, our food security here? Because you take out, let's say the, the Gulf provides what, maybe a, a, a tenth or a third of our sea, seafood? About here? a third of our seafood. It's a huge, it's one of the most productive areas around the United States and certainly competitive in the rest of the world in terms of uh, different seafoods, absolutely. And then you, you multiply that impact in, and in that China Sea and the, and the Sea of Japan and stuff, you've got some pretty tight competition for food resources there. Yeah, you have a lot, yes. I, I wonder um, what uh, the implications are for those nations and peoples that are dependent on that immediate sea life area. And Arnie, do you have any data that would talk about when it would be before we'd see, wow, don't eat that seafood because people are actually coming down with something because of that, or the seafoods, how long would the sea life live? I wonder if we would even know that. Well, I, um, th there, there was a paper out about a week or two ago that discussed the fact that the uh, cesium concentrations in rivers hundreds of miles away are increasing, not at the top end of the river, but as the river uh, goes down, it seems to be accumulating it more and more and more, and they're seeing it in the soil. So I, I don't think we're, uh, we're at the end of the issue of contaminating Sea of Japan or the Pacific from the uh, runoff from, from land. Uh, I, I think, uh, you know, I've seen some small fish that in small fish where the cesium levels were clearly uh, uh, much too high for consumption. But that still hasn't worked its way up the food chain yet to uh, the, the type of fish that, that you and I eat, you know, the, the tunas and the salmons and the mackerel, the, 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 the top predators. You know, the other piece of this is we're focusing on cesium. Cesium is a muscle uh, absorber. It's absorbed in your muscles like potassium. But 
<clears throat> strontium is a bone absorber. So we're going to be seeing, in addition to the cesium in the fish muscle, which most of us eat, is strontium in the bone. Now, in, in America, not many people eat the bone, but there are some fish that are eaten whole. And there's also fish stews that cook with the bone as well, and that will mm. re-liberate the, uh, uh, the strontium. So in the, uh, in the next several years, I'm, I'm concerned. Frankly, I think uh, you know the, the EPA and uh, uh, it's just stopped monitoring what's coming in from uh, Japan, and I think sooner or later we're going to get a, a tuna being pulled through a, off a ship and firing off a radiation detector or something like that. I I, I don't really think that uh, on the West Coast the government's doing a very good job of monitoring this. Uh, and I'm, Arnie, I want to confirm something you just said. I was uh, I wrote a column in my Sentinel column back in August about a Woods Hole uh, Oceanographic Institution study that's funded by the Moore Foundation, and they've had some cooperation from the Japanese government and from TEPCO, the power company. And in their announcement of the study, they basically indicate uh, uh, the same thesis that you have, and I'll read here from this that the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution announcement of the study says that while elevated la levels of radiation in ocean waters could present little direct impact uh, for human exposure, long-lived isotopes can accumulate in the ocean food web, as you indicated, and bioaccumulate, and, quote, emit a persistent low dose, unquote, in the marine environment. A persistent low dose, but over time, this could pose a threat within the marine food web as, as um, things bioaccumulate as they move up. So that is entirely possible. Not to be alarmist about this, but I have not seen any uh, of the data that Woods Hole, they began this study soon after the, um, the accident or the, um, the tsunami, the accident occurred back in March. And I'm very, I'll be very curious to see what these results are. They've been doing transects off the coast of Japan um, for quite a while now. I, thought you know, I think you're, you're right about the low dose issue for those people on our side of the Pacific, Australia, and, and quite likely Hawaii. Uh, I think, uh, and so that becomes a public health issue where a little bit of exposure spread out over millions of people has a, has a, a carcinogenic effect but it's hard to say who got that cancer from the from the exactly. cesium from Fukushima. But on the on the other coast, on the uh, within 200 miles of uh, Fukushima, up or down the coast, um, I th I would uh, I'd suggest not to eat anything, um, not because of a low dose, but because of the likelihood of a, uh, of a significant dose from from a, a fish. Yeah, I was just talking to a, a good friend today, and and uh, they mentioned that. Um, their daughter had been selected to do a sister city swap in um, in the coming year, and that she was going to be going to Tokyo as part of this sister city swap. And I said, "Wow, are you going to allow her to do that? What when does travel and tourism and stuff like that look really ill-advised to you? It, I mean, with regard to Japan, would you if, would you send yep. your kid?" I, uh, we have uh, questions like that on the website, and, and frankly, you know, there's so many personal issues that play into it that I really don't, don't give advice about, you know, should I move, or I've had people call and say, should I get pregnant? You know, it's like, uh, I, I really try not to answer that. Totally there's respect that. Okay. So many personal variables involved. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. You know, one of uh, the, another issue, of course, is just the issue of information. And one of the things that stunned me back when um, Deepwater Horizon first erupted and that catastrophe was going on is that BP could declare a no-fly zone in the Gulf. And a corporation could declare a no-fly zone. And now with Fukushima, what kind of uh, challenge is it for you to get information from the, the source, because it seemed like for the first couple of months, there was nothing coming out of there about what was really going on. Well, you, you know, that's, that's a great, that's probably the, that's a great question. Um, you know, and, and I, it, this, the releases from VP, I mean, originally they were talking about a thousand 
uh, barrels a day, and then it went up. That's called the source term. If it was a nuclear plant, it's the source term. And I saw it at Three Mile Island where the nuclear industry and the NRC deliberately downplayed the source term. It happened at, at, with the BP well. You know, there were people who were saying, this is really leaking worse than you're hearing. And so the source term on BP. And when Fukushima came out, I really vowed I was not going to let that happen. And, and I was on CNN the very first week saying, this is as bad as Chernobyl. And if the um, and at the same time, the Secretary Chu was saying, American Secretary of, of Energy, Chu was saying, now it's as bad as Three Mile Island. That uh, the TEPCO and the Japanese suppressed that information for five weeks, and unfortunately, what they had to do was, you know, women that should have been pregnant women that should have been evacuated or young children that should have been evacuated didn't if they relied on the, uh, the Japanese government. I think, though, the, the difference between the Three Mile Island and Chernobyl and Fukushima is that we have the Internet now. And uh, we've, had, we've had close to 7 million uh, visitors on our, on, on our website, plus people that download it to YouTube. So that there's other ways for the information to get out. And uh, people are reacting um, and moving because of what they're hearing from you know, experts like me as opposed to relying on Tokyo Electric. Yeah, I, I, I'm always puzzled by what it takes for the public to say, hey, we want to know. You know I, I know most of us are so busy and caught up and, and um, we've got our own things going on, but good grief. I mean, these things impact everybody. And if, if we don't collectively express our right to know about them, um, you know, the fault's bad on us if, if we're not asking for the answers. But we're at... We're asking. I know a lot of people have been asking for answers on this. And uh, where do you even go? You know, I had Dan Hirsch. I had the good fortune of having uh, Dan Hirsch from UCSC on in April. And and um, he, at the end of the program, I said to him, "Okay, Dan. So, what's the next step? What's the the positive action to take away from this talk tonight?" And uh, Dan said. There is none. Everybody's being paid by NRC. There isn't a politician that will stand up really against NRC. And golly, as we, uh, the residents and the people that are going to be affected by this stuff for generations, um, it seems like we would have the, the auspices and the authority to say, keep us informed. We should at least be informed. You know, when I was uh, on March 11th, the day of the accident, 11 o'clock in the morning, I, I was talking to Maggie and I said, uh, I can't do business today. i got to watch this accident. I said, they are going to have a meltdown. And, so, and the reason was that there was an emergency call out on the Internet for batteries. And when I heard that they had, were running out of batteries, I knew they were toast. And, and yet, here's the, you know, the chairman of the NRC was saying for weeks that, well, we really don't know yet. We, you know, we need to evaluate it more. Um, but the data within the first six, seven, eight hours of the accident told me that there was a, a meltdown in progress and significant fuel damage in three different reactors. So it, people know this, but very few people share this. And I, I think Again, and I said it on our website, the difference this time is that we can all talk on the Internet and we don't have to rely on those official channels. Yeah, that's a, still for now, the Internet's open for us. I, you know, I'm, I'm with a quandary where time, time is ticking by here. There's two clips I'd really like to show, Arnie, and one of them is um, the data gathering process because I think that's pretty unique. Yeah. And uh, the other is your latest clip, with, with the uh, hydrogen uh, explosion. And I, I don't know which you feel is more relevant or more, more exciting to our talk here tonight, but with Dan, uh, with, with the Sea Odyssey group, I kind of feel like it's the data collection. But I, it, I want... it definitely is the data collection one. That one is scientifically much more important. Yeah. And the other one's on the website. So if people want to go up on the Fairwinds website, they can get up right now. And we 